A bank account is a platform for apps to be built on top of. If that sounds like a weird idea, think about the features of a bank account. Most users only have a single bank account, making it a great tool for identity and authentication. The series of transactions in a bank account provides a data set that can be used for analyzing payment history and issuing loans or insurance. But there are difficulties to building a platform on top of banking. There are thousands of different banks, and if you want to build an application that integrates with a user's bank, you need to be able to integrate with any potential bank that the user might use, whether it's Bank of America, Wells Fargo, or Chase. Plaid is a company that builds APIs for users to connect to banks. Applications such as Venmo, Betterment, and Coinbase use Plaid to connect with the bank accounts of their users. Jean-Denis Gris joins the show to explain how applications use Plaid and how Plaid has scaled its infrastructure to handle a high volume of requests. Jean-Denis also discusses the potential of banking as a platform and the strategy for expanding the APIs that Plaid can offer to developers. I want to mention that Fintech Daily is a new podcast from Software Engineering Daily covering payments and cryptocurrencies and trading and the intersection of finance and technology. Fintech Daily is looking for new volunteer hosts for Fintech Daily. It's currently a unmonetized podcast. We're just building some steam with it. So if you're interested in working with us to conduct interviews, you can send an email to host at fintechdaily.co. We take care of much of the frustration of doing a podcast, of hosting a podcast. We will teach you to podcast if you are technical enough to do a show on fintech daily and you are reliable enough to produce that show if you want to find out more you can send us an email to host at fintechdaily.co and you can find the podcast on itunes google and everywhere else if you're interested in listening to it don't hesitate to reach out we'd love to get some new hosts and with that let's get on with this episode of software engineering daily We are running an experiment to find out if Software Engineering Daily listeners are above average engineers. At triplebyte.com slash sedaily, you can take a quiz to help us gather data. I took the quiz and it covered a wide range of topics. General programming ability, a little security, a little system design. It was a nice short test to measure how my practical engineering skills have changed since I started this podcast. I will admit that, though I've gotten better at talking about software engineering, I have definitely gotten worse at actually writing code and doing software engineering myself. But if you want to take that quiz yourself, you can help us gather data and take that quiz at triplebyte.com slash sedaily. We have been running this experiment for a few weeks, and I'm happy to report that Software Engineering Daily listeners are absolutely crushing it so far. TripleByte has told me that everyone who has taken the test, on average, is three times more likely to be in their top bracket of quiz scores. And if you're looking for a job, TripleByte is a great place to start your search. It fast tracks you at hundreds of top tech companies. TripleByte takes engineers seriously and does not waste their time, which is what I try to do with Software Engineering Daily myself. And I recommend checking out triplebyte.com slash sedaily. That's T-R-I-P-L-E-B-Y-T-E dot com slash sedaily. Triple byte, byte as in eight bits. Thanks to TripleByte for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. We appreciate it. John denis you are the head of engineering at Plaid. Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Jeff. Plaid is a company that lets developers connect their users with banks and financial institutions. So it's a way to connect a user's bank account to an app. What are some use cases when an app would need to connect to a bank account? Sure. So 
Here's the overall picture. So uh, first in the United States, the, the first thing to understand about why Plaid exists is there are 10,000 banks, right? It's not a very concentrated banking market where you just have a few institutions that are serving most of the population. And so because of that, there's been just a lot less standardization around even things like how do you transfer money you know, from bank accounts? How do you know that a bank account belongs to somebody? How do you build an app that's centered around understanding someone's like, spending habits, for example, to give them like, financial advice with regards to you know, saving for retirement or whatnot? So you have all this complexity that just stems from how, like, the lack of concentration in the market. So the insight behind Plaid from you know, four or five years ago was very simple, which is like, there's been a lot of innovation in tech, but it hasn't really touched like financials, right? And and the reason for that is if you want to build a tech company around like a fintech company that's building a better product experience around anything that people do with a financial system every day, you, you need access to someone's spending history and you need to be able to transfer money back and forth, right? So I think a popular app today might be Robinhood, right? That, that provides zero fee like brokerage, right? But to do that, you first need to be able to get money into that app. And to get money into the app, you need to authenticate that a bank account actually belongs to somebody so that it's not a fraudulent transfer of funds. And there was no really standard way to do that before Plaid. Or if you want to, off, if you want to create a better lending experience like Lending Club, you need something better than a credit score to determine whether someone can pay back a loan. And the way you generally determine that is by, is by figuring out how much do they earn? How do they spend money? Like, are they, you know, are they like a conservative spender that you feel good making a loan to? But to do that, you need access to like their financial history. Like, where do they spend? How much do they spend? How much do they earn? And so on and so forth. And traditionally, the only party that would have that is someone's primary bank. So, you know, the insight behind Plaid is if, if you make it easy for anybody to have access to that information, and when I say anybody, I'm any app developer, if you make it easy for a consumer to kind of share that information with an app that they want to use, then you'll get all this product innovation on top of the financial system. So let's say I'm a user, I'm registering for an app that uses Plaid, like Venmo, for example. What's the process? Describe the process of me signing up for that app, and what am I giving the application, and how is Plaid operating in the middle to connect my bank account to that app? Your, your consumer signing up for Venmo, the whole thing that Venmo does, right, is like it allows consumers to send money to one another, right? You want to, like, after you spent dinner, you want to, like, pay someone back because they fronted and paid with our credit card, how do you send them like $50, right, to, to make up for the balance? So you, you sign up for Venmo, first time user, and Venmo needs to know that you have a bank account, that they can transfer money like to Venmo so that Venmo can then transfer money to the other user. And the problem for Venmo is they don't know who you are, right? you're just a person on the internet. All they have is your phone number. So they need a way to go from that to like, you're a real human being, you really have a bank account, that bank account has money, and here's how you can transfer the, the, the money from that bank account to Venmo. And like all of those questions don't have easy answer. So, you know, they're traditionally in the US, you, you would use an account and routing number to say this is my bank account. But Venmo couldn't operate in a world where you could put in a random account and routing number and then they just take money out of that account. That's just not good enough, right? They want to make sure you really are the person with that account. And this is where the plat flow plays into it. So the consumer basically is shown a screen where they log into their bank account. And you know, they log into their bank account via Plaid. We actually take care of the like connecting with the bank itself and we authenticate, hey, this is really this person's username and password like actually like allow them to log into the bank account. The bank account, the bank gives us the account and routing number that we then pass back to Venmo. And so then Venmo doesn't just allow someone to enter a random account and, and, and routing number. They get it from the bank itself via us. And that gives them a lot more certainty that it's a real human being. But then there's a lot more stuff that we do on the side, right? When you open a bank account, you go to a branch, right? And they generally, you know, they verify you're a real human being, right? They verify your driver's license, your mailing address, your phone number. So what we'll do with Venmo is we'll provide them, for example, like this is the phone number on the bank account. And Venmo also has your phone number because when you signed up for, for the app, you had to do two-factor auth where they sent you a text message right, that you responded yes to. So then they look, do the phone numbers match? Right? And that's another thing that helps determine whether the identity of the person is, is the real one. And there's a number of things like that that Plaid enables that allow you to make sure, hey, not only is it like a real human being, but this is really their bank account. And then the last step that we provide is how much money, like what the balance is in the bank account. Because obviously you don't want someone to like try to transfer money that they don't have, considering it takes about you know, two to three days for an ACH transfer to go through. So that's kind of the last part of what Plaid does vis-a-vis -vis transferring funds. 
And these are all very, very simple things, right? And, and the product experience is extremely important. Like from the consumer's perspective, they just, all they care about is they're like logging into their bank account and then magically, like they can now use this, this app called Venmo. But it's a lot of very simple things that just don't exist in a standardized way. Like no, no bank you know, makes an easy API available to, to, to do any of this. And so Plaid had to like build this from nothing and not just on top of like one, two, three, or four banks, but literally on top of you know, more than you know, 10,000 institutions in the US. Give me an overview on how that works, because if these banks don't offer an API for users to connect, you have to do some kind of magic behind the scenes in order to give what is essentially a unified API across all of those banks. Yeah, I mean, that's the magic of the company. So I can only talk about how we do it to a limited extent. I'll tell you that the way it was done years ago is pretty different from how it's done today. In as much as like today, a lot of the banks actually like want to partner and work with us and will provide us like either private APIs or, or ways to make these flow work faster. Right. So I think we announced a few weeks ago kind of a partnership that we have for Chase, for example, you know, which is one of the, 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 the big three banks in the United States. That makes life just a lot easier. But like at the origins of the company, you, you, you had to start with screen scrapers or using banks like web APIs intended for consumers and build kind of like a, a B2B product on top of it. And I think a lot of the early magic of Plaid was, you know, do, doing so was, was painful and it, was, it wasn't necessarily the, you know, it's, it's not the kind of work that when you're a CS student, like in school that you dream of doing, but we did it at scale, right? We, we didn't build like 10,000 individual in- integrations. We found ways to integrate with banks in a, in a scalable way. Like we have some integrations that works with, with hundreds of banks at a time, for example. That's probably as much as I can tell you about the details of how it works. The, the truth is that took, like there are companies that tried to do, and actually did some of what Plaid did in the past, and they took a very like one bank by one bank, like manual approach to it. And we've kind of taken a very like scalable, like a hard engineering approach to it that leads a higher quality product that's been a lot easier to scale to get coverage in the U.S., Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine, you know, I was just kind of thinking about how you could potentially solve this. And, you know, one one way is, like you said, you maybe you have some, basically a browser set up on a VM somewhere, and then a user makes a request with their bank account credentials, and you, you could literally open a web page on the VM, go to bankofamerica.com, put in the banking credentials, and then scrape the screen and then the user wouldn't really know the difference, except it would just be kind of high latency, and it's just kind of a janky way of, of doing it. But it would get the job done. I wouldn't have any, like, as a user, I wouldn't have any uh, opposition to that. And, you know, banking should be turned into a platform, so I would be happy with that if that got the job done. But I can imagine that, you know, whatever your early approach was, and, you know, whatever the kind of hacky approach was, as you built some traction and the bank started noticing they're like this is great like this is useful for you know this this allows customers to do additional things with our bank i can imagine them being more eager to partner with you especially cuz it would just expose them to uh, you know a technology i mean now you have banks and they're very eager to partner with uh, fintech companies or explore fintech companies for potential acquisitions cuz these banks are kind of you know, they're starting to notice, you know, the financial system is changing and they're wary of those changes. How has your relationship with the banks changed as the business has evolved? So first of all, I think what you've just described is almost 90% accurate version of, of the early days of Plaid. And just like you said, I think initially, I wouldn't say that all of the banks were super excited that apps were being built on top of their data, right? Because, you know, if you're a lender and if you believe in the hypothesis that to be a great lender, having as much information as you can about someone's spending habits gives you like kind of an advantage in how you can price that loan, most people go to their primary bank to get a loan. Like that's, that, that was true like 20 years ago. That's, that's, that's what you would do because that person had the most information. They would give you the, the best loan. You know, and you could you could try to go to another lender and you'd have to print a bunch of PDFs and go there. And but they might not, you know, they don't have a relationship with you. It might be it might be tougher to, to get to get the best rate. So if you look at it from that perspective and then suddenly like anybody can now get access to the data, the data that allows you to 
price alone really well, well, that could be a little bit scary for a bank, right? Because there's kind of a, they used to have a more captive audience, and now you're opening up, you know, the, the product experience and the, the lending experience much more broadly. And I think so in the initial days, I wouldn't say every, like every bank was like super enthusiastic to work with us. But what's happened over time is just as you said, like the consumers have like really reaped a lot of the benefits from the fintech ecosystem and they, they demand it. And I think for a lot of the banks, they realize, well, we're really good at things A, B, C, and we're not, we're not good at solving problems maybe like D, E, F. And there are a lot of startups that are like addressing those problems and providing real value to, to our consumers. So now let's like, let's empower those startups to work with us. Right. And so like for a lot of apps like expensing apps or like business apps, like there's, you know, for the banks, it just makes a ton of sense to work uh, with those partners. So as, as that has happened, what we've seen at Plaid is the banks are, are like more and more willing to work with us in terms of like data access. And we have I mean, I think we have like daily phone calls with like a large number of banks as part of our BD team to like strengthen the relationships and to find even better ways to work together to get around some of the latency issues, for example, that you described when you take a, a kind of screen scraping kind of browser approach, you know, which is like, frankly, just doesn't scale super well. So it's, it's been the nature of the relationships has have changed substantially. And today we definitely think of ourselves and I think most of the banks see us as a partner. There's only one little caveat to that, right? It's, it goes back to the 10,000 bank issue, which is we're doing super well. We're a, but we're a 170 person company. You know, we don't have the ability, right, to, to have relationships with all of the banks. And this actually, for us, something that's very important. Like, can we make sure that a small credit union, right, in Omaha can provide their customers with all the apps that they're now expecting that you would, you know, naturally be able to connect to if you're, if you're working with Chase? That's really important for us, right? Because if we don't do our job well and connect as well with the smallest banks, then actually now in today's world, it puts them at a competitive disadvantage, right? Because their consumers will be like, wait, hold on a second. I can't, I can't use Venmo. I can't use like Wealthfront to, to save for retirement or whatnot. Like, like the consumers will want to use these apps. So, you know, that's what makes the work kind of complicated. I think it what makes it like also very interesting. And, you know, there's a weird thing that happens when any engineer joins Plaid. One of the first things that you do is you work on an integration. That is, you work on like a connection with a bank and either trying to improve it or trying to take a bank that we don't have any support for and, and try to add support for it. And so when I joined a, f- a few years ago, even though I'm the VP of engineering, I, I, I wrote code at first like everybody to kind of understand the nature of the work. And you finish your integration and there's basically people who used to try to connect to an app that they love and it just didn't work. And then you, you fix that and then it works for them, right? And you stop getting tickets or you, know, you realize there's like 100 people every day who can now have a slightly better experience around their finances. And like, I don't know, that mission I think really, really resonates. Is so a bank account is this platform and you can do all kinds of interesting things with bank account data some of those things are are useful to the consumer some of those things could potentially be threatening to the consumer because it's very sensitive data it's a bank account and back in the day people were afraid of putting their credit cards online originally they overcame that fear now i think people are slowly overcoming the fear of putting their bank account information online but the, but the most recent service I, that I use that I think used Plaid was Siftery. So there's a, something called Siftery, Siftery Connect, I think, is their product. But basically, like looks through your purchasing history for your business bank account and looks at all the SaaS tools that you've bought, and it helps you make buying decisions based off of your SaaS tools. And like I saw this, I was like, this is amazing. This is really useful to me because I run a podcast, but I. All you know, I, even though it's just a podcast business, there's enough web services I buy that it's useful for me to see this diagnostic of where am I spending? Am I spending too much? But obviously, I don't want my banking data to be abused. So if I were to give an app permission, an, an app that I'm not familiar with, that I don't know about, access to my banking data using Plaid, what can that app do with my data? What are the restrictions? Okay, so... A couple of things that are really important. First of all, like the way Plaid works, right, is we can only get access to the data for consumer kind of like through our flow and powers us to, to access it. And all we do with that data is we only provide it to the app that you've connected, right? There's no, we're not reselling the data or anything. We're just a pipe, right, between the bank and the app. But as you point out, you know, there's a question like, can you trust the app in the first place? So you can self-serve into Plaid. Like you could today, if you wanted, you could sign up for a Plaid account and you could use your SDK and you could start build an app. But you couldn't put any meaningful volume through that app until the app went through like a pretty deep compliance check with us. 
basically we we have to be very very careful like who is building a business on top of plaid and you know to make sure that they themselves aren't doing anything like nefarious with the data so that's like the first that's the first answer the second answer is the nature of the data that they can access depends on the kind of app that they're building. So they either get access to account and routing number if they're an app that wants to transfer money. And if with that generally will come access to like your balance information or they get access to your transaction history. Uh, and this is for apps that either need to give you financial advice or that need can something like credit scoring, like something that eva- evaluates somebody's risk or kind of The third kind of big product that we have is something called kind of identity verification. And that's generally used for businesses that are trying to see if somebody really is who they say they are to avoid kind of fraudulent scenarios. So those are the three main types of data that people have access to. And it depends on the kind of app that's being built, like which part of the data we we, we will connect to. And when you connect to the app, it'll actually actually tell you, right, like what is happening. There's a pane in in Plaid that tells you what data is being shared. So that's like the the first degree answer to it. The second degree is like next year, like we have a big effort internally, like on providing users with more control over their data after they initially connect it. This would be the equivalent of seeing every app that you've connected, deciding whether to unconnect them. Uh, and so on and so forth. Because user control is like a, like a big part of how we see our role in the system. Like uh, FinTech has sometimes a history of data being shared without kind of user's consent. And we, don't, we just don't think that's right. So you know, we view ourselves as like being an advocate for the consumer and giving them the control that they need and that they want. And you know, we want people to feel like if you're using, you're going through the, the plat flow to connect an app, there is like a baseline of like security and privacy that you can feel really comfortable in uh, with that app. So Plaid has these multiple APIs. You've got authentication, identity, income. You've described some of these APIs broadly. Let's dig into them a little bit. So there's this authentication API. What happens after the user has authenticated their bank account? After they authenticated their bank account, we give the app their account and routing number. And at that point, then the app can use any kind of other service to actually transfer the money uh, using something called the ACA rails in the US, which is the main way that money can be transferred between bank accounts. So for example, we have a partnership with Stripe where, where we return to the app, the account a routing number, and then they will use Stripe to transfer money to or from a certain bank account. So if I'm, let's say I'm building my own payment service and let's say I call it Jeff Pay, and do you know, I want to use the authentication API? What are some of the other APIs I could use that would be useful, just as if it's just a payment service? I mean, if, if you're using authentication and you're going to have money go back and forth, you want to use balance to make sure that the money, there's enough money in the account for the transfer to happen. So ACA rails allow you to transfer money, but they don't tell you if the money is there in the first place. And there's a pretty steep penalty if you try to do a transfer and the funds are not available. So that's the first thing you would do. You would use, you would use balance. The second thing you really want to do is you want to make sure that the person uh, is who they say they are. So you want to find a way to get the person's identity, say their name, uh, first name, last name, or their phone number, or their email from some other service. So say they have a Gmail account, you ask them to authenticate with Gmail so that you get their email and name, and then you want to make sure that it's the same one that they have on their bank account, like at the very least. And the third thing you might want to do if you really, really care about fraud is, is look at the kind of transactions that have happened on that bank account. So this would require you to connect not just the auth product, but the transactions product to see if the spending pattern is like way, way different than what they would expect. And the reason why you want to do all these things is you want to get as far away from any like fraudulent money transfers as possible, right? Because, well, just for obvious reasons. Logi Analytics is an embedded business intelligence tool It allows you to make dashboards and reports embedded in your applications. Create, deploy, and constantly improve your analytic applications that engage users and drive revenue. You focus on building the best applications for your users while Logi gets you there faster and keeps you competitive. Logi Analytics is used by over 1,800 teams, including Verizon, Cisco, GoDaddy, and JPMorgan Chase. Check it out by going to logianalytics.com slash data science. That's logianalytics.com slash data science. 
Logi can be used to maintain your brand while keeping a consistent, familiar, and branded user interface so that your users don't feel like they're out of place. It's an embedded analytics tool. You can extend your application with advanced APIs, you can create custom experiences for all your users, and you can deliver a platform that's tailored to meet specific customer needs, and you can do all that with Logi Analytics. Logianalytics.com slash data science to find out more. And thank you to Logi Analytics. The idea of building your own fraud analysis system on top of the transactions that a user has gone through. So this would be like an additional layer because banks have their own fraud detection system so is the you know if i'm building some kind of like a a lending platform on top of my payment service maybe I i really do want to know how liable this person is to commit fraud but why why wouldn't i just trust the the banking like the banking layer of a fraud detection system do you mean like the credit score system for well, example. no. So, like, I mean, I thought banks were pretty good at identifying fraudulent transactions. So, if I make an API request to Plaid for this user's, you know, list of transactions, and I, why would I want to do further analysis on that? Wouldn't I just, you know, couldn't I just trust the bank's knowledge of what is a fraudulent transaction that they've rejected already? I mean, you look at their transaction history to see if the the transfer that they're trying to do via Jeff Pay is like out of character for that human being. Okay, I see. So for, for example, like if the account connected is of somebody that's never used, you're the, literally the first fintech app ever that they've connected to the bank account. Maybe you want to ask them to do an extra verification step, such as, you know, you could use like a, a driver's license scanning service or whatnot to just really, really 100% make sure that it's this human being that's connecting through your app, right? Because literally they've never done anything like this before. Right, right. I understand. So we've gone through an overview of the APIs. What are some ways that people have used these APIs in methods that have surprised you? This is one of my favorite questions. So I always talk about this customer because I think what they're doing is very cool. There's this this company called Tally. They're not very big. They're a startup. What they do is they use us to look at how much interest rate your credit card company is charging you when you can't pay your credit card bill. And what they determine from that is whether effectively your credit card company is overcharging you interest relative to your current kind of credit standing or ability to to pay back a credit card. So like a scenario might be you applied for a credit card after the financial crisis when you'd lost your job for whatever reason, right? So you had a pretty poor, let's say, credit score. And so the credit card company came back to you with a really high APR card. And you kept, you've kept it this whole time, right? And now you've got a good job and life is good and you're generally paying your bills on time, but not always, right? Sometimes you, you, you carry a balance on your card. And when you carry a balance, you're paying, you know, whatever, like a, a pretty high rate. And so Tally will go in there and they'll be like, hold on a second. We'll pay your credit card bill for you and then we'll charge you less interest because we think you're more trustworthy, right? Or we think your credit standing has changed over time. So they're doing arbitrage between how risky someone really is and the balance on their credit card account. I mean, I, when I heard about it and, you know, they're, they're growing fast, like they're doing well there. I was like, that's amazing, right? They're like, literally this app is helping, like is helping people like get a, a credit profile that's like more in touch with their current ability to spend and not what it was whenever they applied for a credit card, you know, years ago. It's, it's really powerful. Uh, and and there's, a, there's like an innovation like that that's happening that no one in the history of Plaid would have said like, hey, this is the thing that should happen. Or there's a company called Drop, which is a Canadian company, or at least launched initially in Canada. They look at how you're spending money on, on credit cards, and they basically give you points with certain stores that you're spending a lot at. So for me personally, I spent a lot at Whole Foods. And then so I get an extra basically like 0.8% cash back at Whole Foods from just connecting Drop. And the idea is because they give me these coupons, it incentivizes me to keep going back to Whole Foods because I want to keep kind of earning drop points that work on there. It's a kind of like automated loyalty program where I don't have to worry about like scanning things or whatever. It just literally just looks at how I'm spending money to do it. It's, it's very cool, right? For me, like it's like a little bit of, of extra money that can, that can go back to consumers. So there's a ton of apps like that that are being built. And like we're totally neutral and like agnostic of any of this, right? Like our goal is we, we want to make sure that 
things that are built on top of us are like trustworthy and like real businesses. But then we want to, you know, give the power to developers to be really innovative and build great things on top of Plat. So I think every month, so we, we have a internally like a dashboard of all the apps that are using us. And there's always, every month, there's a couple of new apps in the top 20 or in the top 50 that I haven't heard of. Uh, and, you know, I do some research and, and half the time I'm like, wow, that's, that's very cool. That's something that should exist. I never would have thought it, about it myself, but it's just great to see that they found a way to build this business on top of us. Very cool. Well, let's get into the backend engineering. So we've talked in uh, some detail about how Plaid is making establishing a connection between the user and the bank, but there's obviously a whole lot more in terms of the supporting infrastructure. Give me an overview of the Plaid engineering stack. Sure. So, I mean, first we're all on AWS, which from a security and scalability standpoint, just just makes a lot of sense and, and solves a ton of our problems for us. Language-wise, most of the backend is, is written in Go. Some of the bank integrations are mostly written in TypeScript today. And then probably the third part of, of the stack is we're really proud of not just our API, but the SDK that we give developers to build apps on top of Plaid. Like, you could get started and build a very basic app in, in hours as far as the Plaid integration is. And so, you know, obviously we have an Android SDK and we have a, an iOS SDK and a web SDK and those written in, you know, you know Objective-C and JavaScript and, and Java for each platform. In terms of interesting technology, so personally, and I think most of the team at Plaid does not care that much about either hard problems or specific technologies. We're like one of our, we're very, very pragmatic, meaning we just want the easiest tool to use to solve the problem at hand. You know, so, you know, on AWS, we use, we use Aurora and we use DynamoDB and we use Kinesis. Like as much as possible, we're using managed versions of, you know, the Kafka or like MySQL or like a key value store so that we don't have to worry about the operational aspects of it. The areas that are, that are difficult for us generally stem from the fact that we don't control our database layer, right? In most companies, you, you generally control, you know, there's some level of the stack and then you control everything below. Well, at Plaid, you control everything below until your database, and your database is literally 10,000 banks in the U.S. And so that brings a lot of really pretty Plaid-specific, interesting problems. For example... We could, it's possible, we try very, very hard never to do it, but it's possible for us to like DOS a bank. And if you think about a small bank that doesn't have a ton of infrastructure where you have users that are, you know, using apps that require like data to be updated very often, that's really dangerous, right? We don't, we don't control that. We also don't control downtime of our banking partners. If they need to do a big version updates on a Saturday night for three hours, there's absolutely nothing we can do. Like, you know, we will not be able to connect accounts to that bank for that, for that time window. So so just because of that, we have a lot of challenges around monitoring this infrastructure that we, we don't control, right? To make sure that we're being really good citizens with it, to make sure that we are correctly identifying when it's down versus just slow versus the APIs have changed and we weren't told that they were changing kind of, kind of scenarios. And then there's addition to that, there's a long tail problem, which is some of the smaller institutions, relatively speaking, don't get much traffic. So how do you tell the difference between like it's down and just like it's so slow right now because of something going wrong along the way that it's it's not down that's like one of the core challenges to plot and then it interestingly has i don't know how much you care about engineering culture but it has a fascinating effect on engineering culture so at most companies or i used to work at amazon right so you must have when you were there you must have just been infatuated with the idea of like as many nines as possible like you know do we have four five six nines of uptime like what is it and i worked at dropbox before where you you know, for storage, you, we care about the nines like quite a lot. Plaid's a little bit different, right? Because the truth is the banks themselves as a class, I'm not saying any one individual bank, but as a class, they're just not up the whole time, right? Like some of them are built on old mainframes where when you need to do a software update, it could take like four hours on a Saturday. And so if you're already losing, say you're losing like four hours a month just from your bank partners, right? on aggregate, like talking about four nines or five nines, or six, it makes no sense, right? Because your customers, our customers are actually used to us sometimes just not being available for, through no fault of our own. But the problem with that culturally is it means that now then everything else at Plaid doesn't necessarily have to care about being more than three nines availability, right? Because you 
you've got this like baseline <laughs> that you can't get better at. And then if that's culturally, if that starts affecting your team, then you've got to ask yourself, well, how, does that mean people are not going to care as much about like great engineering practices? So obviously that's like the nightmare scenario. So we care a lot about great engineering practices and we care a lot about having more than, you know, three nines for our own services. But that's something that we have to do like very consciously as a culture because like the market isn't going to lead us in that direction naturally. That's one thing that's interesting. You know, any fintech company, security and privacy is just like really high up on the list. I think there's some of the big companies out there, the ones that are used by hundreds of millions of people. Most of them in their history have had a, a, a few bad security incidents. You know, it might be making some users' photos available to other users. It might be, it, it might be like things have happened, right? And generally you get one or two bad incidents and and then you wake up and you're like, okay, well, we've got to hire a big security team. We've got to like, do this right. Can't, you know, can't, can't have this go wrong. At Plaid, there's a class of these things that if they happen are kind of company ending. And that's true about most fintechs where you transfer money. Like, you can be down, but you, you can't mess other things up. Right? You, there's some nightmare scenarios where money doesn't go from the right place to the right place, for example, because you make a core mistake. So thinking about how do you build software while keeping those constraints intact earlier in the life cycle of a company than you would normally have to is, is, is interesting. Like, I have a Dropbox example where like, Dropbox was much larger before I think it had to think about these things at the level that, that we have to at Plaid, just because it, it could afford to wait a little bit longer. And like, Dropbox takes security you know, very, very seriously. I'm just, like, just making an observation in terms of Plaid had to worry about that way before I joined, you know, when it was just like a 20 or 30 person company. Well, I think people, I'm not sure how, how uh, you know, in the earlier days, people weren't maybe using Dropbox as aggressively in terms of mission critical documents or, th- you know, like storing my, not that I have one of these, but like a password file, like, you know, like the keys to the kingdom kind of thing. But with banking information, it's kind of from day one, you don't have this really high bar for how sensitive the data is. So you, you said about this idea that all the banks are basically the back ends. So that is to say that if Plaid takes the data from the bank, like if I authenticate Plaid to, to give me all the transactions associated with the user, you're not storing those transactions yourself. You're just handing them off to the user and you're not storing them. It depends. We're, we're effectively caching them, right? Because if you've connected multiple apps and the multiple apps want updated transaction data, we can't hit the bank servers for every app every time they want an update. So there's like a caching aspect to what we do. Can you tell me more about that caching layer? Like what's the conveyance of data look like between the bank and the user? So on some interval, most banks, we are forced to pull, right, data at some interval. So at a certain interval... We're like, hey, these apps need updated data for this user. We talk to the bank and get raw data from the bank. And then what we do is, and that's done through uh, like a, we use gRPC internally. So, so all that is, is synchronous. And then we get raw data from the bank. We actually store in a, in, it's like a, it's a permanent store, but it can be deleted because we can always get the raw data back from the bank. Then we enhance the data. So we have a whole data pipeline that enhances the data. So one of the problems, right, is if you use two different credit cards to buy the same thing at Home Depot, the transaction strings will look different with the two different credit cards and banks that are, that are the issuers. So what we want to do is make the data look as standard as possible so that it's easy for a developer to use. So we have a bunch of machine learning and a data pipeline that it does everything like it identifies, like what's the location of the store? Is this a chain store? Like uh, normalizes the transaction to try to find like the zip code and like if it's recurring or not, categorizes it as this like a, a purchase at a grocery store or is it at a gas station or is it like a, like a bill, whatnot. And so pretty complicated pipeline that gets to eventually at the end of it, like clean data that again is stored. And then what happens is we send webhooks to all the apps that are using us, just telling them, hey, there's new data available. And then each app, as they want or need it, will contact us, just do like an HTTP request to our endpoint, uh, authenticates, and gets the updated, updated data for that user. 
that's like the rough pipeline. There's like tweaks to it, but that's most of it. And, you know, for historical reasons, some of the, like we're mostly microservices based. So like you can think of a beautiful version of this, which is like where every service is, is kind of stateless and, and does its thing. Unfortunately, you know, like any fast growing company, we have some technical debt from the old days that that's still in there. So, you know, so a couple of these services rely on a shared MongoDB cluster to like share state, the share metadata as, as the pipeline is going through. And, you know, things like that don't, don't scale and are harder to reason about than, than other parts are. Don't, please don't let any listeners think that everything is perfect. There's, there's plenty of, of, of things that need to be fixed. And then the other parts of it that are important is, you know, from a privacy standpoint uh, and security standpoint, all sensitive data is basically encrypted as soon as we get it from the banks and not decrypted until it goes back out to customers. So a, an example would be account and routing number, like f- from most of our system, like like 98% of it, right? It, it's just like some encrypted string. So the one thing that you said that stood out was this idea that you have these 10,000 banks and their infrastructure can blip out at any time or they can change their, maybe their API surface. And so you, you want to have this proactive monitoring where you are at some interval pinging these different banks and making sure like, okay, can we still authenticate with this bank? Can we still get transactions with this bank? And so you, you know, with all these with all these different APIs, you want to probably hit these banks at a regular interval to make sure that all the all the APIs still work for these given banks. What's the process of managing that infrastructure for for doing that regular testing across all of those banks, iterating through all of those banks and testing them all. Yeah, so actually, so it's really, so when I joined, I actually came in and I was like, oh, we need just the service that you've just described. But it turns out our volume is so huge that we don't really need to ping the banks to see if it's up. Like we find out with real traffic extremely quickly if something has changed. So mostly it's mostly it's about validation, about like some metric, we have a, a number of metrics that we track, like that, that we track. Some metric will start to behave badly if the data is off. And number two, the second channel is support to tell us if something is off. So like I'll give you an example, like very simple one is we get an account routing number that's like the wrong length right? Or the name on an account changes or like someone who used to have five accounts at a bank suddenly has zero. Like there's these like flags, these things that happen as soon as the data isn't what it's supposed to be. And we we have a kind of interesting on-call structure internally. We have something called bank on-call, which every engineer is on regardless of what team they work on. And basically, if one of those things goes wrong, it's bank on-call's job to get it, to get it fixed like ASAP. Managed cloud services save developers time and effort. Why would you build your own logging platform or CMS or authentication service yourself when a managed tool or API can solve the problem for you? But how do you find the right services to integrate? How do you learn to stitch them together? How do you manage credentials within your teams or your products? Manifold makes your life easier by providing a single workflow to organize your services, connect your integrations, and share them with your team. You can discover the best services for your projects in the Manifold marketplace, or bring your own and manage them all in one dashboard. With services covering authentication, messaging, monitoring, CMS, and more, Manifold will keep you on the cutting edge so you can focus on building your project rather than focusing on problems that have already been solved. I'm a fan of Manifold because it pushes the developer to a higher level of abstraction, which I think can be really productive for allowing you to build and leverage your creativity faster. Once you have the services that you need, you can deliver your configuration to any environment, you can deploy on any cloud, and Manifold is completely free to use. If you head over to manifold.co slash sedaily, you will get a coupon code for $10, which you can use to try out any service on the Manifold marketplace. Thanks to Manifold for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. And check out manifold.co slash sedaily. Get your $10 credit. Shop around. Look for cool services that you can use in your next product or project. There is a lot of stuff there, and... $10 can take you a long way to trying a lot of different services. 
So go to manifold.co slash se daily and shop around for tools to be creative. Thanks again to Manifold. That idea of on-call, maybe you could just talk about monitoring and DevOps more broadly. So like, there are a number of companies I've talked to where on-call rotations have become much, much easier over time as they've moved to more and more managed services. But there are some cases where there still is a lot of on-call due to certain infrastructure complexities or just the nature of the service. Can you tell me about monitoring and DevOps and maintaining uptime? Yeah. For Plaid as a whole, I don't think our DevOps is like super different from how other companies do it. And I think the observation that you just, just stated, which is like with managed services, there is, we just have less worry there is mostly accurate. I think the deltas are, first of all, because we're a platform company, we also like sometimes we get spikes in like API usage of us that is totally unexpected. So one of our big customers launches a new use case where they need to call balance a lot more often. And they decide they want balance calls like at eight in the morning because that's when most of their users come online. And like, boom, we have a huge traffic spike, right, that comes in. Like things like that happen. And when they do, like from an SRE perspective, it's like, wow, auto scaling might break or, you know, something because it's just like so out of the ordinary, you have to deal with it. But, I, you know, the practices of a much bigger company like Amazon, like the lightweight versions that we have internally take care of that. So for SRE team, we actually call it platform, which I think is a little bit telling because we don't call it DevOps or SRE. We call it platform because most of the work is actually in making internal developers like efficient. The scaling aspects, we've kind of, gone in a pretty good place you know they have their own on-call rotation and you know if something nightmarish like that happens like off hours they're going to jump on it immediately the bank side is pretty different so the truth is if we, we have monitoring right on, on, on things going wrong with banks with 10,000 banks things go wrong all the time like literally like every hour something happens and some of the stuff that happens is like really weird right it's like bank a decided to merge these two saving account types into a new type and we don't categorize that type as a saving account because we've never seen it before, right? So the metric that goes up is like now there's a bunch of accounts for this bank that are like they're categorized as miscellaneous, right? Because we don't know if they're a credit card or a checking account or a saving account or whatnot. That happens all the time. And you actually don't, you definitely don't want to wake someone up like in the middle of the night to do that for a couple of reasons. Like reason number one is it happens all the time. And so if you're going to do that, you'd have to have a really distributed team everywhere in the world uh, if you wanted to like keep things good. And, and at our size, that's just like way too much of a cost. Number two, users probably don't care that much at that point in time that that's correct as long as you fix it really, really quickly. So what we do, and the, the thing with monitoring is it, it's not just did something go wrong, but it's like, what's the impact? Like, how many users are likely going to be affected by this in the next, like, 24 hours? So, obviously, if it's Chase, if there's a new account type at Chase, like, all hands on deck, like, figure it out, right? Or if, if you know, if Chase changes, like, one of their internal APIs, I mean, they, they would always tell us in advance, but, like, if that happened, like, go, okay, all hands on deck. However, you know, for a smaller institution, you might be like, well, we, we expect five or six people to be affected by this in the next like couple of days. And then, you know, then you, it, you just auto create a ticket, right? And then you have, you have somebody take it on as part of like regular quality work, which we're pretty good at. There are exceptions to that. You know, anything that touches a counted routing number going wrong, that's really high on the list, obviously. But, you know, if like anything else, like, you know, our machine learning model is not able to categorize a larger percentage of transactions than usual. That's often not the end of the world. We find out about it. We figure out how much the impact is on our users from a data quality standpoint. Depending on the impact, you know, we either work on it like that day or that week, you know, that month kind of, kind of mentality. The final thing on this, which is, I think, important is a service is only as good, only has to be as good as its competitors. And that is, please, I hope no one's listening like to that negative way about how I feel about the quality of Plaid, because I think our quality is super high. But the delta between the service we provide and most of our competitors is, is pretty big in terms of data quality, in terms of uptime. And so what that, what's done is it actually gives us, our, our customers are very understanding of the complexity of the problems that we're trying to deal with. And they have actually, like, frankly, they're really good partners and they have, they have an understanding of how hard it is, right? Because they themselves are building products on top of the same things, right? So they, they understand why it's hard for a machine learning model to always categorize things 
correctly because they on their side are also trying to like categorize things as well and they know how tough it is. So that, that gives us a, like a nice level of understanding in terms of the domain specific issues that happen in, in, in the banking world. So that, that's like a, and you know, our bar is very high because we think of how good we do all these things. That's the mode of the business, right? It's if there's going to be a competitor to Plaid, how many tens of millions of dollars and how many years are they going to have to invest to get to our quality level? So we take it very seriously, but you have to recognize that we can't do all of it perfectly all the time, just given the complexity of the problem. Definitely. Well, your engineering is somewhat, you know, you're you're in a, like you said, this this spot where you have your back end is kind of controlled or bottlenecked by the banks themselves, and it, it's an interesting constraint. I mean, it, like you said, you you have to be just better than than your next best competitor, and if you if you can do that, that's great. And it's you know, it's just the nature of the business that you can only do as good as the lower level of of the bank kind of allows you to do, which makes me wonder. So we did a a series of shows a while ago where we talked to some of these new banks. We talked to uh, New Bank and Monzo and N26. And it was interesting to see how banking might change. But I mean, more broadly, like I've talked to, I've talked to other fintech companies, TransferWise and Stripe and all these Bitcoin companies, Coinbase. And it's like every fintech company I talk to, they have a gigantic vision for for how things are going to change in in their domain, because it's just like fintech is not going to be the same, like this idea of kind of having to rely on, on banks and their you know, they have as as much as, you know, all due respect to banks, it's just kind of old infrastructure and we kind of need better systems of financial movement in the world. So from where you sit at Plaid, what's your personal vision on how fintech changes in the next five, 10 years? What are the things that you're most excited about? So first, I want to echo kind of the last thing that you said, which is you said with all due respect to the banks, right? Like from a technical perspective, you know, they aren't up to the like latest standards or or people's expectations about how systems can interoperate or the quality of service that they provide. So what I'll tell you there is one thing I've been quite surprised by relative to before I joined Plat to now is how seriously like a large percentage of the banks take that and are trying to get much, much better at it. Right? I don't, they're definitely not sitting on the sidelines of Monzo or Simple and, and thinking that you know, they don't need to kind of like keep stepping up their game in that dimension. And they've got very good people who are working really hard at it. So I don't know if my end game vision of the world is one where like banks are totally out-innovated by startups. I do think what happens is a lot of the banks are forced to step up. And some, some are successful at doing so and some are less successful at doing so because of these kind of competitive pressures from, from new fintechs. So that being said, our thesis at, at Plaid is pretty simple, which is there's going to be, we're like at the very early stages of fintech innovation. And like one way we think about it is a lot of the innovation should happen in, the, from, in terms of the product experience that's provided to consumers. So traditionally, there's this like infographic somewhere. And it, it shows a picture of the Wells Fargo website and it shows all the dropdown menus in the website. And for each dropdown, it has the name of like five to six companies that are trying to innovate for that product, right? And it could be like transferring funds or loans, or it could be mortgages, or it could be saving for retirement, or it could be 401k, or it could be sending money to friends, right? Literally. And there's like, literally there's, there's like 30, 50 boxes and each one has three to five companies. So, you know, when you talk to Robinhood or some of the new banks, like they actually kind of want to replace Chase, right? They just want to be a better version of online Chase. They want, you know, Robinhood doesn't just want to do the brokerage, right? They want to own the entire financial relationship for a consumer. I think the way we look at it at Plaid is a little bit different. Like, we're not sure in the next wave there'll be a ton of consolidation. Like, we kind of view it like there's going to be apps that are really good for saving for retirement if you're this kind of person and other apps for saving for retirement if you have a different profile. And then there's going to be apps for like how you manage your finances if you're like really tech savvy and send some that do it for you. But the point is there's going to be a kind of like a shopping mall of for every aspect of our, your financial life that you care about where there's going to be some category winners, but they're probably not, you know, they're going to be too specialized to win 
horizontally. That's like kind of definitely personally the, the end game that I see. And that's what we're seeing with Plaid, right? We're seeing more and more innovation. So maybe at some point there's a consolidation phase that happens, but that, that seems like more in the future than we are today. We're still seeing like the core things that banks do being heavily, heavily like iterated on top of and perfected from a product perspective. And that's even weird things. Like one example is, um, the name escapes me right now, but it's a company that they're helping with like loan repayments. All they do is the consumer experience of like when you've got a loan and you need to make payments on it, how to make that like better from the user's perspective, right? And then they're going and selling that to banks and to startups and to a bunch of people. Like that business is not going to expand to com- to completely, you know, put the banks out of business, but it's like a multi-billion dollar like TAM that, that, that someone needs to go after. Yeah. So what we want to do, and so what I'm really excited about is kind of going up the stack from where we are today to make it easier for the next generation of startups to create better product experiences. And I think the end game of that is if you're, it should be as easy to develop in fintech as it is to just develop for anything. You shouldn't really have to worry about fraud, about how you move money around. You shouldn't have to worry about creating your own like lending model. You should just be able to use one that's just like best in class. Like all of these things that are difficult today that you have to do in house, you shouldn't have to do. So if you look at like Coinbase, they have a big fraud team. They have an awesome like fraud team that's trying to detect like fraudulent transfer money in and out of bank accounts like via Bitcoin as a way to anonymize it. They're awesome at it, right? The next company in that space, they shouldn't have to build that functionality internally. Like we should be able to provide, like a company like Plaid should be able to provide the scoring and confidence necessary that you don't need that that team internally. Likewise, like for any lender in terms of like trying to determine like how credit worthy somebody is, like literally every lender out there will have a data science team that's working on this on risk. And there's not a ton of competitive advantage. Like two lenders that have access to the same input of data going in, like will make very similar decisions on the way out. The Delta has been what data are they looking coming in, right? There are some new lenders that are looking at like signal from like social networks, or they're looking via Plaid at signal from transaction history. But once you once you have access to all the data, like you should just be able to provide a model that multiple people can use. And then the problem isn't one of like, hey, can I like issue a loan? The problem is one is like, how do I find places where people are looking for loans and can't get them? How do I get to those customers and make it easy for them to get like you know a loan when they're buying a television or, or, or whatnot? And so that's the view of the future I'm really excited about is like making it trivial for developers to innovate on fintech. And, and fintech can touch everything, right? It should touch like a mattress company that needs to offer financing to people. Right. That shouldn't be difficult, but it is. That's what I get excited about. And the weird thing about Pod, honestly, it's true about any platform company is you see the innovation on top of you. Right. And you're enabling it, but you're not quite part of it. So one of the you know, fun things about the job is like when when I do talk to customers and learn about the problems that they have, even building on top of us, because that just gives me a, a whole bunch of ideas of what we need to do next. And I think that's not very different from Amazon, right? Like early Amazon, it's S3, it's EC2. And they were like, oh, people are using EC2 to run like MySQL all the time. Why don't we have a managed MySQL, right? Like, oh, like people are de- dealing with bigger and bigger data sets. And so they're like, you know, they're running like these giant spark clusters or whatnot. Like, why don't we try to build like a, a data warehouse for them, right? Or like, oh, everyone using Kafka and message queues. Like, okay, we'll just like have Kinesis. I think w- there's a version of that for Plaid, which is going from raw data to like insights or to the financial building blocks. And it's not, by the way, just tech innovation. It's also like compliance and like legal innovation. Like, you know, to issue a loan, you need a bunch of licenses and, and so on and so forth. Like, what if we had an API for loan issuance? I, that is like way in the future, right? But what if we could do that and you could start a company that issues loans, but you yourself don't have to like do any of the legal or compliance work. It's all taken care of for you. Like that, I think that would be an awesome future. Well, why not? I mean, you know, I log into QuickBooks and I know that there there is some loan issuance system within QuickBooks and I believe that they outsource it to somebody and that is one of the markets like loan issuance. That's one of the markets where like you said there's the, it's not going to be this some winner take all like somebody dominates the API for lending. There's going to be a bunch of different APIs for being able to issue loans with different data sets and so on. And what you've said about Plaid, it kind of reminds me of a show I did with Checker recently, because you know they do the background check API 
which sounds like this you, another it's in it's in, this is a kind of very similar thing where it's like the way that they do it you know and the the API for background check it's not pretty it's not clean you know it's like because these background check process kind of sometimes requires people going to look up paper documents and but you know the experience that Lyft gets is just they make an API request and and they get the background check as a response and it's there's such high volume that goes through the system that checker like you said has, has with plaid being able to, to leverage the data flows through the system can see what are the things that people want out of this system that we're not currently providing and checker has you know already built a bunch of products that envision a, a future with a, a more futuristic version of a background check and then eventually like what do people use background checks for applying to jobs so maybe checker is like a job search platform or a job acquisition platform and it's like the the room for expansion of these apis that have high volume use cases it doesn't seem to be to be limited it's very rare that you hear about one of these api companies like we've run out of ideas you, you don't hear that no i mean your customers tell you what else they need and generally it's pretty adjacent to the things you're already doing so yeah i mean checker is a great company there's you know i think because we're much smaller than stripe I always try to look at like companies that are that are bigger that are kind of paving the way. I always feel like you know the way you could think of Strike as just a payments company, but if you think of them as like making it really easy to start a business online, it just takes on like such so much more scope. And you know that's the mission, right? And and because that's the mission, you know they can do things like Atlas, which just you know takes so much pain out of just starting a company and and getting it online. And so I, I love that. I mean I think the view of Plaid's future is very much along those lines. Uh, it's just it takes you know you, you you can't the mistakes with startups. I think sometimes is to you haven't quite won your, your your Act One before you worry about Act Two. So we're like hell bent on winning Act One and. We're starting to do, you know, some of some of these kinds of things next year, which I'm pretty excited about. But I wake up every day and it's, you know, it's like, are we still the best at what we do with the banks? And are we set up to keep being the best for that over the next, you know, two to five years? Uh, and you can't ever lose the eye of that prize. As exciting as like other things that your customers want you to do for them and, and you know, the the, cool, the, cool, the, the the pots of gold that that, you know, one day would represent. Well, jean Denise, thanks for your time. This has been really interesting and I'm excited about your future with Platt. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me on. Honestly, the questions are fantastic. I felt like you engage much more with kind of what's different about fintech than than a lot of people I talk to. So really appreciate your time on on not just the interview but but the research. And, oh thank uh, you. Yeah. Thank you. OpenShift is a Kubernetes platform from Red Hat. OpenShift takes the Kubernetes container orchestration system and adds features that let you build software more quickly. OpenShift includes service discovery, CI/CD, built-in monitoring and health management, and scalability. With OpenShift, you can avoid being locked into any of the particular large cloud providers. You can move your workloads easily between public and private cloud infrastructure as well as your own on-prem hardware. OpenShift from Red Hat gives you Kubernetes without the complication. Security, log management, container networking, configuration management. You can focus on your application instead of complex Kubernetes issues. OpenShift is open source technology built to enable everyone to launch their big ideas. Whether you're an engineer in a large enterprise or a developer getting your startup off the ground, you can check out OpenShift from Red Hat by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Red Hat. That's softwareengineeringdaily.com slash Red Hat. I remember the earliest shows I did about Kubernetes and trying to understand its potential and what it was for, and I remember people saying that this is a platform for building platforms so it's kubernetes is was not meant to be used from raw kubernetes to have a platform as a service it was meant as a lower level infrastructure piece to build platforms as a service on top of which is why openshift came into manifestation so you can check it out by going to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash red hat and find out about OpenShift. Wow!